What if you found out you are the heir to a long-lost aunt's estate? Houses, cars, and a bank account with a huge balance. How will that change your life right now? Think about it. The truth, though, is that you are an heir to a rich estate. Not from a rich aunt, but from the wealthiest family in the universe. God himself. When Jesus died, he left you a will. Many have no idea about it, and so they do without. For you, that is all about to change. This September 17th to 20th, join Pastor Steve at Dominion City Church. In four days, he will show you who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and how it changes your life right now. After this event, your health, finances, and relationships will never be the same. Register now at dcgeorgia.org slash faith. And get ready, because this weekend will make 2020 your best year yet. Praise God, praise God. God has been so good to Ross, and I'm so grateful to him for what he continues to do um, in our midst. Um, and I'm glad for the amazing plans that he has for us. The Bible says that the plans God has for us, they are plans of good and not of evil. You will never find in the Bible where the word of God says that God has planned evil for his people. So irrespective of what the daily challenges that people deal with are, God is good and he takes his people from one level of glory to another. I strongly believe that God has a word for you today and that it will bring transformation in your life. Amen? So let's jump right in. Um, go with me to Isaiah chapter 54. One strategy the enemy has is to wear people out. So the Bible talks that in, in the last days that many people will experience heart failures um, because of the amount of things that are going on on planet Earth. It's almost as though it's a hopeless situation when you look out there. If your eyes are just focused on what the world is, is, is saying, what the news is saying, what is happening, it's almost as though it is hopeless. Because it is one of the strategies of Satan in these last days to wear people out. So the Bible says that the heart of many will fail. The heart of many will fail. Why? Because of the level of things that are going to be bombarding planet Earth. Now, that is why, please, it is it's very, very important um, for us that you understand that where you're standing matters. It's very, very vital that you are at this point in time standing on God and on, on nothing else. You don't build your faith on things that are fickle. You don't build your, or your faith or your trust on things that pass away. Because in these last days, anything that can be shaken will be shaken. Now, I don't mean to be a prophet of doom, but the truth of the matter is that as the end time continues to come closer and closer, there's going to be more and more things that will be going on on planet Earth. But I want you to understand this. The fact that it is going on does not mean that it has to directly affect you as a child of God. There's a different budget, there's a different plan that God has for his people. If you study the Bible and you look at um, the time in Egypt when there were one plague after another, one whatever going on after another, the Bible said that in Goshen, where the people of God were, there was constant peace, there was constant blessing, things were good. So I encourage you as a child of God, locate yourself in Goshen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Position yourself inside God in this time. Find yourself where you are in God. And um, I was meditating and I was praying about this season and God said something to me and, and he said, I give it to you as a charge throughout this month to do it as an assignment with God's people. He said, deepen your walk with me. 
deepen your work with me. Deepen your work with me. Go an extra mile to make your work with God a deeper one. Are you getting what I'm saying? When things are shallow and they're on the surface, it's so easy, very, very easy for things to come and blow them away. So, and whenever God starts talking to me, he starts using everything around me to reinforce it again and again. So this morning I walked into church and I saw the beautiful canopy that was out there and it's very nice and fame and the team, they've done an amazing thing that they've done. Out there. No, it's not the one on the screen. So I don't know the one. So, um, it's out there and it's, and it's beautiful and, and all that. And I was admiring it. Initially I was like, wow, this is good. Uh, then all of a sudden the wind came. And it blew it off. So when it blew it for, off, I asked um, Chid, I said, go call for him. See, that thing is going. So, so, and I stood there watching what they were doing. They came and they put the first reinforcement and they put the second reinforcement there and what happened? It went off again. It went off again. So the moment the wind came, he took it off. And I was there watching. So what they did was that they went and they got a third reinforcement. This morning, I was just there. And they got a third reinforcement and they anchored it on three major points. So that way it's able to stand. And as they were doing that, the Holy Spirit kept talking to me. He said, this is the time. Have your people deepen their walk with God. Because the things that are going to be blowing on planet earth. If your feet is not deepened in God and the winds of life comes. That's why the Bible said that in the last days there will be a great falling away. Because sadly, there's going to be Christians who have not taken time to deepen their walk with God. So I want us to read a scripture quickly. Run with me. Um, Isaiah chapter 54 verse 1. Let's look at this quickly. I'll be reading from the New King James translation. It says, sing, O barren, you who have not born, break forth into singing. Cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. This is talking about if things have not been the way you thought they should be, start rejoicing because there's going to be a change very soon. Can I hear somebody say amen? Okay, now, but whenever you receive a prophetic word, you need to know what do I need to do to position myself to make sure that I take advantage of what God wants to do. So look at the next verse, verse 2, and that's where we're going to. Look at this. He said, enlarge the place of your tent. Number one, enlarge the place of your tent in order to accommodate what God is bringing. Enlarge the place of your tent. That's the first one. And let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Number two. Number three, do not spare. In other words, don't hold back. Don't hold back. Do all that you need to do. Don't hold back. Okay, now do not spare. Lengthen your cords, but look at the last instruction there and strengthen your stakes. Somebody say with me, strengthen your stakes. Strengthen your stakes. Say it again, strengthen your stakes. Strengthen your stakes. Say it one more time, strengthen your stakes. Now that is the charge this morning. Strengthen your stakes. What does it mean? Now, in the old days, they dwell in, in tents back in the days. Now, you can show the picture of that tent. They dwell in tents back in the days. And tents don't have in-depth foundation inside. So, and, and they were nomadic. So, they traveled from place to place. And they lived in tents. And when they do that, for your tent to be able to stand, you have to... Tie a rope to it and knocking a stake into the ground. You have to strengthen it. Now, listen to me. If you're going to have a big tent, then you must have a stronger stake that holds you down. Because if you don't and the winds come, you might wake up in the middle of the night and see open heavens. Because your tent traveled while you were sleeping. And that is how it is with life. Because you see, there's a connection between how high you're going to go and how deep you've gone. If you're not willing to take our time to go deep enough, I am sorry. 
you're not going to go high enough. When I see people that play with their Christianity and they don't invest in their Christian life to become a deepened person with God, I've seen somebody that God won't be able to take far. Because the higher you go, the more fears the wings become. And if you don't have a strong stake holding you down, then definitely something is going to blow you off. And that's not God's plan for us. Is somebody hearing me this morning? Tell your neighbor, strengthen your stakes. So God gives it to us as a command. Because the plans he has for us, they are thoughts of good and not of evil. God wants to make you a mannequin of his glory. God wants you to be somebody that people are going to look at and they want to know who is your God. God wants you to be a display of his glory. But for that to happen, brother, for that to happen, sister, you've got to take time and strengthen your stakes. Strengthen your stakes. So let's look at more scriptures on this before we dive in. Um, Colossians chapter 2 verse 7. Let's look at this in the New Living Translation. Colossians 2, 7, New Living Translation. Run with me, please. It said, let your roots grow down into him. Say it again with me. Let my roots grow down. Two people were building. And one person was building a bungalow and the other person was building a skyscraper. And they began to build on the same day. And three months later, the guy that was building a bungalow was almost done. He was at the roofing stage and all that. And he comes out to the lot of his neighbor. And he's wondering, what are you doing? We started on the same day. How come I'm almost done and you're here? You're still digging foundation. What are you doing? You know, and, and, he, and he was chuckling and he was laughing. And to him, I'm so fast. You know, to him, this guy doesn't understand what it takes. He's not as smart as I am. So, five months later, he was done. He was at the painting stage. And he came down to see his friend's house. And the friends were still busy pouring concrete into the foundation. He's like, man, I don't understand this. We started at the same time, but look at where I am today. Look at what is going on with you. And the friend lifted up his eyes and said, listen. In order to build what I've been called to build... I have to make sure I go deep inside. He said, where you are stopping is my foundation stage. Because for me to build a skyscraper that is going to go up high, I must take time and deepen my walk with God. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. That's why when I see people that don't have value for the things of God, I've seen people that their life will end up in mockery. Because when you do not pay the price to deepen your walk with God, and when the winds and the challenges of life show up, strengthen your stakes. So look at this. He said, let your roots grow down into him, into Jesus, and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will do what? Grow strong in the truth you were taught. And you will overflow with what? Thankfulness. But what's the key? Let your roots grow down. It doesn't happen overnight. There's no quick pill to it. There's no microwave in it. I can't lay hands on you and impact on you the spirit of prayer. You're going to develop the anointing. You must spend time on your knees. I can't Bluetooth it to you. There's no shortcut. The supermarket of God does not go up or come down in price. There's no inflation. It's still the same. And in these last days, a lot of Christians are wary because Satan is, an, is at an onslaught. And sadly, people have not built the steel that is required to take care of the storms of life. Help me tell your neighbor, strengthen your stakes. Okay, let's run, let's run, let's run. I want to show you one more scripture in this. Um, go with me, Second Kings chapter 19. Second Kings chapter 19. And I'm going to show you one way, at least today, we're going to look at one way to strengthen your stakes. So, but let me give you another background scripture on this. Second Kings chapter 19, look at verse 30. 
New King James translation. And he said, And the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Are you seeing that dimension? And that's how it works with God. First of all, you take root, what? Downward. Then you can now bear fruit, what? Upward. When you are seeing results in somebody's life, there's a reason why they are there. Listen, success leaves clues. When I meet people, I want to study what happens behind the scene. It said, they that of the remnant of Judah shall first of all take root, what? Downward. Now, in other words, the more your roots are deepened, the more you can excel upward. The more you're deepened. I don't want to be a one-time success. I don't want to be that person that was successful five years ago and that's it. The Bible said that we are meant to be like that tree planted by the rivers. But because that tree has its roots gone deep, he said no matter what is going on on the outside, the leaves are always green. Because the roots are not subject to the weather. It is subject to what is happening deep inside. Deep in your walk with God. When it happens, listen, and things are going on around, it doesn't move you. This morning, I was meditating on a scripture, and it so blessed me. And it was Paul that wrote that. He said, I have known in whom I have believed. Let's do a jump there. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And he said, there are so many things that he was dealing with. And he said, none of these things move me. They don't mean anything. Why? He said, because I know in whom. I know a person. It's not a thought class knowledge. It's not somebody said and somebody said, so I read it in a tweet. No, he said, I know in whom. I know Jesus for myself. I have encountered this Jesus Christ. I know in whom I have believed. Brothers and sisters, listen. Surface Christianity is not enough. It's not enough. With what is going on on this planet Earth, it's not enough. This morning it was again on the news that there's another hurricane hitting again. Meanwhile, there was one last week. I thought it took time to come. But as the days are wrapping up, these things are crazy. And that's why if you look at the surface, your heart fails. Oh, but if your roots are deep, God is calling us to deepen our walk with him. He's calling us to that. He is. The time has come for our roots to go what? Deeper. So look at this. He said, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know in whom. Somebody say in whom. So it's not about, you know, <laughs> all of us are just saying it, but you know, I don't really know. No. This is the time for us to spend time with God that you know God for you. I know in whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. Which day? Until the final day. That's what he's talking about. He said, I know him. I know this Jesus. I know this Jesus. So today, I want us to look at quickly how to deepen your work by developing a vibrant daily devotion with God. Listen, deepen your walk or strengthen your stakes, as you want to call it, by developing a daily time of fellowship with Jesus. A daily time. It's only in Christianity that we say we belong to Jesus, but we never spend time with the one we say we belong to. We have enough time for Netflix, for Hulu, Enough time to comment on social media. But we don't have time to sit with Jesus Christ. We have enough time to do everything. But we don't have time to sit with the one we say that we fell in love with. Deepen your work. How? By cultivating a daily quiet time with God. Now, these are one of the major disciplines of the Christian faith. If you're a Christian, listen, Christianity is not a club. It's not a religion. Christianity is not a religion. I see people that say, what religion do you belong to? Uh, are you Muslim? I say, no, I'm a Christian. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a picture of God and his family. And family spends time together. Did you hear what I said? Christianity is a picture.
picture of God and his household. And the more you spend time with your father, the more you recognize his voice. The more you know him. The more you're not shaken by things. Because you know in whom you have believed. So let's look at this quickly. Jesus made a statement in John 15 verse 5. Please, I'd love to read this in the Amplified Version. John 15 verse 5. It's a good scripture to memorize uh, where he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, huh? then he said you will be able to bear much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. Let's look at the amplified version of this. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit, irrespective of the year and time. Did you get that? He is the vine, we are the branches. Can I say this? Christianity is not an independent life. I'll say it again. Christianity is not an independent life. You will soon understand what I mean. Christianity is not an independent life. If you're going to be a Christian, listen, you are a branch connected to a tree. You want to stay alive, remain connected to the tree. You disconnect from the tree, you're going to die. It's simple. And look at the deceit. The deceit is this. Because if you go to a tree right now and pluck out a branch and you look at the leaves, it's still green. But the fact that it's green does not mean that it's still alive. It's dead. It's a matter of time. So Satan understands that principle. So what he does is that he disconnects us from a vital fellowship with God, knowing that with time, things are going to run us out. But because on the surface, initially, it looks as though all is well, we're deceived. So, look at this. He said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For otherwise, watch this, otherwise, apart from me, that is, cut off from vital union with me, you can do nothing. Jesus was not apologetic about it. He said, you can do nothing. He didn't say, you know, you might be able to do some things. No, he said, you can do what? Nothing. Zilch. Zero. In other words, and Nick, I was explaining this to you last night. You might be busy running around, but in heaven, when they look at you, you've zeroed out. But on planet Earth, it looks as though something is going on. Because if a car is on the highway and the engine cuts off, do you notice that for a while, that car is rolling? And you might see the car and be like, look at that car go, but it's not going anywhere. It's about to pack up. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. So, I think the latest iPhone right now is, um, what is it? 11 Max Pro. The 12 is meant to come out, but I think COVID slapped them back and, and they couldn't. We have people here that work with Apple. So, yeah. Um, so, let me ask you this question. And I want you guys to put up for me these two pictures. Um, one is an iPhone 11 Pro Max. The other one is a Nokia 3310. If you know Nokia 3310, it means you're old school. <laughs> it's one of the first phones we had back in the day. You use it as a weapon. When somebody offends you, you stone the person with the phone. Then you still walk up and collect the phone. <laughs> Nothing happens to it. But the thing about it is that there are no apps in it. Nothing. It's just calls. Amen? But let me ask you a question. Quick question. You have an iPhone 11, or even the iPhone 12 that is coming out in a month's time. You have that but it's not charged, so it's dead. And somebody else has a Nokia 3310. If there's an emergency, who has a phone? Among the both of you, who, who? Who has a phone? You see, with all your apps and with all your sophistication, if you're not charged, you can do 
nothing. The life source of a Christian comes with vital union and fellowship with Jesus daily. Daily. On the surface, you might look all that. And people that make choices based on surface stuff will be intrigued. But when the chips are down, that's why Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's why I said, the Christian life is not an independent life. You must stay plugged in to the source of life, Jesus Christ. Because if you're not plugged in, then there's trouble. You and I must every day, 24 hours that he has given us in a day, we must create time to stay in his presence. Deepen your walk. Strengthen your stakes. How? By cultivating a daily walk with Jesus. Let me give you this real fast. Let's run. You, you guys know that in Mark chapter 1 verse 35, Jesus Christ every morning, even though he was the son of God every morning, the Bible says a long time before day, he departed to a solitary place and there he prayed. Every morning, every morning, Jesus will go apart and spend time with the Father. And that is why he made a statement. He said, I only do what I see my Father do. But where did he see the Father do that? In the place of devotion. So when Jesus spends time alone with God, God will show him what needs to be done. Then he comes out and he executes them one after the other. But if you don't spend time with God, how will you even know what God is saying? How do you know when the plans have changed? How do you know what God is saying now? Some of us are running with an agenda that has expired. Because we've not spent time in the presence of God. Every day, map out time. Map out time every day. Can I say this? The depth of a man's intimacy with God in the place of prayer determines the height of his exploits in the world. The depth of a man's intimacy with God in the place of prayer determines the height of his exploits out there. Because let me actually tell you, how this thing works is, you discover what God wants you to do, you go and you do it. Because in that, his perfect will, the grace to do it is already there. The provision to do it is already there. The angelic backing to do it is already there. The heavenly backing to do it is already there. That's why you and I need to spend time. You download from him, then you go and you execute. You download from him, then you go and you execute. You download from him, then you go and you bring it to pass. Amen? Is somebody hearing me? Quickly, let me give you five benefits. Or oh, five reasons why. Five reasons why you need to have a daily daily quiet time, daily time that you spend with God. Five reasons. Number one, having a quiet time daily helps us develop the most important relationship of our life. The most important one. Which is what? Which is our intimacy with God Almighty. Spending time, having a quiet time daily. Now, the more you spend time with Jesus, the more you fall in love with him. Let me tell you something I've noticed. Have you kind of noticed that when an aircraft is up there in the sky, it looks very small? Huh? Very small. You can even do your finger like this and, and it fits in. Do you know why? Because you're very far from the aircraft. Jesus becomes so small to you because you're far from him. The closer you get to the aircraft, the more you find out how big an aircraft is. That it can contain you and your whole family and your clothes and your bags and everything and still have more room. The more you get closer to Jesus, the more you realize how big he is and what he's able to do. That he's bigger than all your problems and the things that you're crying about. But if you're far from him, he looks very small. Is Jesus small to you? The problem might be the distance. Draw nearer to me and I will do what? 
draw nearer to you. So having a quiet time daily helps us develop the most important relationship of our life, uh, which is intimacy with God Almighty. Um, number two, having a quiet time daily makes us develop the most important personal habit of all time for a Christian. The most important personal habit you can have. Because your habit forms your character and your character determines your outcome. So if you form the habit of spending quality time with God daily, it will show. When you open your mouth, it will show. It will show in, the, in your depth of revelations. It will show in the level of insights that you get. It will show. Is somebody getting this today? So before you tune in into CNN or you tune into whatever, CNBC, tune into God's channel in heaven. Hear what your father has to say first. I remember after I got saved, I was taught this. I was taught not to talk to a human being in a day unless I've spent time with God. And I was practicing it. You know, wake up in the morning. Part of it is that wake up early, spend time with God before the world starts their noise. Amen. Okay, number three. Developing a quiet time or a, a time of devotion with God makes you read the most important book in the whole world, which is the Bible. And it helps you to grow in your covenant rights, in knowing who you are in Christ. It helps you to grow in your covenant rights. It helps you to grow in your covenant rights. Praise God. Okay. Number four, please, in order to show you number four, I want to show you a scripture in the Amplified Version. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, Amplified. Please put it up for us. Look at this quickly. I want you to say this. He said, and we all with unveiled face, continually seeing as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are progressively being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to even more glory, which comes from the Lord, which is the Spirit. What is this talking about? The more you spend time with God, the more you're transformed into his image. The more you behold him, the more you're transformed. The more you behold him, the more you're transformed. That's why the Bible said that Moses so spent time with God that when he came out, his face was shining. And he didn't know. He, was, he thought it was normal. But everybody saw him and knew there was something different about this guy. And in the New Testament, the Bible says that when the apostles and the disciples, when they spoke, people took note of them that they had been with Christ. If you spend time with God, it shows. If you spend time with God, it shows. If you're highly irritable and snatching at everybody and you're the cat and, you know, you're biting at everything around you, hey, get in. Go lock yourself up with God for one hour. It does something to you. If you notice that you're full of fear and panic and everything is shit, no, 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 come out from there. Go spend some time with God. It shows. Because the more you spend time with him, we are transformed into the image of God as we spend time with him. As you spend time in his presence, as you wake up in the morning and you dedicate your first one hour to God. It's amazing how many of us have been enslaved by the phone. See, I do a lot of studying. I do a lot of courses. I do a whole lot of um, self-development and stuff. And even in the secular world, they will tell you that one of the worst things you can do is to look at your phone within the first hour of you waking up. Now, this is purely secular. They tell you that when you wake up, take, and that's what watch all of them, they're either, they're either meditating or something that they're doing. All these guys are just trying to copy God and copy Christianity. Listen, when you wake up, spend time with God the Father first before social media. That thing that they sent you as a message that you, you're having the urge, you just, woke, you just woke up. Some of us even have the phone under our bed that as you turn, you behold. So now you behold the phone and you're transformed to the image of the phone. That's not God's plan for us. Your first morning, your first hour should be with God. And it does something to you. Can I hear somebody say amen? And fifth, okay, the um, fifth one, our deep heartfelt questions 
are answered in God's presence. You have questions? Go to God. Let me show you a scripture on this. I'm going to show this to you in three different translations. It's going to help you get it. And it's a scripture you know. Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3. NLT first. Let's look at it in the New Living Translation. Is somebody getting something this morning? Okay, so look at this. God said, ask me and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know about things to come. Ask me. You're worried about the future. Ask me. It's amazing how many of us run around. We ask everybody. Shaniqua. Shaniqua. And all the quads. But you won't take time to ask God. Huh? You know what everybody said on Twitter? Apart from what heaven said. God said, ask me. There's an open invitation. Ask me. And God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, will he not do it? If it comes out of God's mouth, then he will bring it to pass. Ask him. Ask him. Let's look at this from the Amplified Translation. Same stuff. I want you to see this, please. Run. Call to me and I will answer you. And tell you and even show you great and mighty things which have been confined and hidden, which you do not know and understand and cannot distinguish. He's giving you an invitation. If something looks like a mystery, it's because you've not spent time with God. Spend time with him. Last, let's look at this in the message translation. Message translation. Let's go. Let's see what he says. Okay. He said, call to me and I will answer you. I will tell you marvelous and wondrous things that you could never figure out on your own. Amen. Amen. Some of us like trial and error. And we born eight months doing trial and error. Don't do that. Ask God. Amen. Okay, three strategies for having a successful quiet time. That's where I end this. Three strategies. Three strategies. Number one, set a regular time that you meet with God. Set a regular time. Listen, when, somebody is, when something is important to you, you fix an appointment. Hello? Huh? When something is important to you, you create an appointed time for it. And that's what an appointment is. If somebody tells you, we're going to meet, when, whenever, how, however, where, wherever. You're not important. <laughs> Did you get what I just said? No, because when something is important, you set a time. So when do you meet with God? When? Oh, Jesus, I love you. When is your set time daily to spend with Jesus? When? He said, I just meet with him whenever I can. Then he's not priority in your life. He's not priority in your life. If he is, you give him a time. Do you go to work whenever you can? Huh? You close whenever you can. I just go to work. When are you coming into the office? Whenever I can. You'll be fired. So if Jesus is important to you, you can't just leave it vague. And some of us, that's how it is. Our life with God is so vague, there's nothing specific. So our work with him is not deepened. Because it's just all over the place. And that is so wrong. So set a time. Tell your neighbor, set a time. And more advisable, make it in the mornings. Unless if, you know, you walk... Um, at a schedule that clashes or something. But set a time. Ideally in the morning. Now, somebody might be like, but why morning? The Bible said early in the morning, Jesus, uh, in Mark 1, 35, I just read it for you. He steps aside and he communes with God. So make it early in the morning. Praise God. Are you getting that? Okay. Secondly, please, withdraw from distractions. Don't... Don't come where there's so much noise. Everybody's jumping around. Maybe you have kids. Now you've, you wait, then your kids are all up and they are jumping on you and one is plucking out your hair and you're trying to read your Bible. And they say, what are you doing? He said, I'm doing my money devotion. That's a lie. See, do it before they wake up. 
Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Do it before they are awake. Take your time, handle this before they wake up. So that way, by the time they are getting up with all their noise, you're done. Amen? Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Finally, number three, create an atmosphere that is conducive for fellowship. So if you're the type that a worship song helps, put on a worship song. Sit where you can have time with him. But please let me tell you this. Don't, don't wake up in the morning and say, I want to pray. And you kneel by your bed. And you draw your pillow close. Are you having a quiet time or another sleeping time? Because what now starts happening is, Father, I thank you. And you wake up 30 minutes later and you say, Amen, Amen, Amen. I just bless you. I just, I just, I just bless you. And in heaven, God will also look at you and say, I bless you too. <laughs> Don't do that. Get out from the environment where you'll be tempted to sleep. Amen. Are you getting what I'm saying? Uh, I was teaching my kids this. I said, you wake up in the morning, go brush your teeth, wash your face, then come out to pray. I said, if you're able to fall asleep after that, then uh, I need to lay hands on you. Amen? So, do that. Then, in your quiet time, I want you to do at least these three things. Now, it's not restricted to these three, but at least do these three things. Number one, read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Number two, pray. Of course, you talk to God. Amen? You read your Bible. You talk to God in prayer. You pray in tongues. Spend some good time praying in tongues. It's edifying, I assure you. Now, if you're here and you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of praying in tongues, please, we can help you after service. It is yours. It belongs to you. God has given it to you. Don't leave it on the table. Take it. Amen? Then, thirdly, journal. Write what God is saying. Journal. Journal. Take time to write. Take time to write. Listen to me, as a trainer, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be real with you. As a trainer, if you're somebody I'm coaching and you walk in to have a meeting with me and you don't have a writing material, number one, it tells me you're not serious. And I won't waste my time with you. You will notice that that meeting is going to be very short. It's going to be maximum three minutes and I will discharge you to go because I don't have words to waste. If what I'm saying is important to you and you value it, you'll come ready to write. Some of us appear before God and we are not ready to jot down what God has come to say. So at the end of the day, we don't, oh, what did God say? It was like something and it was nice, but nothing. You're missing out a lot. Never do that. Don't make that mistake. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? So get ready to write. The Bible says in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 1, he said, I will set myself upon the ramparts and I will hear what God will say to me. And I'll be ready to write what he says to me. And God, when he starts talking, he said, write the vision and do what? Make it plain. There's a discipline of capturing what God has said. That ability to pen it down does something to you. So that later you can go back to it and read it again and see what it is and gain clarity. There are certain things that you're dealing with right now that God gave you the answer six months ago, but you didn't capture it. Because God is never late. He goes ahead of you. So before you start dealing with something, he brings the answer before you will need it. Majority of the times when I face something, all God says is go back to the notes I told you. And you go there and you see it clearly. He wants ahead of time. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Did you get that? You got that. Okay, I appreciate God. Give Jesus praise. 